Hello everyone and welcome to a RimWorld tutorial series inspired by one of Avak's very own dapperlings on Twitter, he said, or they said. The series is great, which is true, Avak does a really good series, but they didn't understand what was going on. So, I said, I'll do it. So let's do this tutorial. We'll start off with a very quick run through of how to start. The creation of a world is very simple, you click create world. You get this opportunity to put in a seed, which is basically completely meaningless, except you can share it with other people. So if you see uh, e.g. Avax videos, you'll see that he will put in the seed, which is often dapper. Oh, put caps lock on. That's f Never happens. Uh, or, of course, you can just randomise it, but we'll put in dapper and see if we get the same world. You can change the size of the world. All this really does is determine how many options there are for you to land. Uh, so let's make a slightly larger one. Why not? We click generate and it takes a while. Then you get the world. This looks very similar to the one we saw, the uh, alien sidearm type of world. And what we'll probably do, you can zoom in with the mouse wheel. And you can see these red dots are existing colonies. So here we have the Victory Gang, a pirate band. You can drag with the mouse wheel. Uh, the mouse button, I should say the slices of misery, another pirate band over there. I suspect you can't actually land on top of these, but at this stage we're just investigating the world. It's given you the opportunity to say that you hate it. Uh, you can see the biomes. This one is, of course, temperate forest. We have desert. We have tundra, a boreal forest, an arid shrubland, which sounds very difficult, an extreme desert, which sounds even more difficult. Uh, and what are these? Tundra, mountainous... So you can see there are several different biomes. Ultimately, all they really do is determine what sort of things you find in the natural geology of the place. Uh, but yeah, we're happy with this. We'll save and finish. And then it doesn't actually do anything. You then have to actually create a colony. Uh, I suppose I'll have to talk about this now. In a minute, we'll get to choose which world. These three uh, are often you know, chosen specifically by a Let's Player or on a stream because they have different ways of determining how the game plays out. Cassandra Classic, uh, as it says, a steadily increasing curve of challenge and tension. Phoebe Chillax means that you have a lot of time to just sort of play the game. The game tends to progress by means of disasters. So there'll be raids, there will be uh, things like solar flares, toxic fallout, all this sort of thing will happen to you and you have to try and you know, work through it and hope that it ends or, in the case of a raid, fight back and survive. Phoebe Chillax will just sort of put a bit more of a gap between those things to give you more time to produce, uh, to get prepared for the next one, basically. And then Randy Random is the one that we usually use on Let's Plays because we don't know what's going to happen and shit just hits the fan time after time after time and Randy is not very nice to you. And then, of course, there is the difficulty of the actual events themselves. Um, I'm not actually entirely sure what they change, but here it says enemies are strong, prices are poor, food is scarce, and colonists are grumpy. So you can tell basically the the yeah as it says the scale of the threat is determined by this one. I think I'm just going to go on rough for now. Rough seems to be a sort of a middling difficulty. Challenge is what it says it's supposed to be played on, but challenge is of course a challenge. These are quite um, descriptive labels here. Base builder just lets you get on with actually creating a base. It's good for testing out things. And then free play, um, you basically, all the threats are there for is sort of token things to bring in more stuff. So we're going to do a Cassandra Classic and we'll put it on rough just so that we actually do get some size and some, you know, actual meaty things happening rather than just cursory things. Now the world that we just created will probably be this one which was created today. Uh, you can name them, by the way. I forgot to note that you can actually edit the name uh, of the world so you can recognise them, which I didn't do and forgot about. But we just created Fun World, which is one letter away from Fun World, so had I noticed, I would have done so. And of course, you can delete them here, but I wouldn't recommend that. I'm going to select that. Uh, no, that's not the one we did. Sorry, what? Sorry, what? Right, American dates. I understand. Here's the world we made. It is not, of course, July, but I just took the largest month and assumed it was correct. So we could cripple ourselves at the start of this and go for something extremely difficult to deal with. An ice sheet, mountainous, sounds terrible. Uh, boreal forest, flat, sounds good. But uh, an easy start 
is somewhere in the middle with plenty of trees, plenty of stone. Somewhere difficult would be lots of ice, not very much growing space, very narrow growing period. There's a lot of things to actually keep juggling while you play this game. So you'll start much like Dwarf Fortress, and I will be comparing this to Dwarf Fortress as we go through. Much like Dwarf Fortress, there is a lot in the initial embarkation that will affect the entirety of your game. And there is a goal to the game, which is to escape the planet again. This one is interesting. Look, it's a, it's just a tribe. It's not a pirate gang. So that's why it's a different colour. We could live next to them if we wanted to. Probably not going to go with that. Um, these places are the sort of place you might want to start off in. You've got quite a wide growing period. So depending on what time you land, you might actually be able to get quite a good amount of crops grown to survive the winter with. And uh, the further you go sort of equatorially, which is strange actually, you'd expect there to be, you know, ice at the bottom here as well, but anyway, the further you go equatorially, you'll probably find that the uh, growing period increases and decreases as you go along. So this is 11th winter to the 1st of winter, which is very small and a very strange time. Year round, that's a good start. We've got mountainous year round growing period, so we can grow at any time of the year, which will help for the tutorial because we don't, well, maybe it won't. Let's change it so that we can actually try and show some different uh, mechanics. Quite a lot of rainfall. The rain does help in certain situations. Sandstone, slate and marble. So these are quite hard materials, slate and marble. Um, the average temperature is 7.2. So we are going to have to look at heating uh, in January, that is. So during winter, it's going to be fairly chilly, but not incredibly chilly. So people aren't going to die of frostbite. Let's just go here. Uh, you can do an advanced button. There's... Um, you can change the starting season, so you can force spring. Permadeath. You can only save when quitting the game. You cannot reload the game to fix mistakes when the colony dies. At it. So sometimes, I don't like to play with this because sometimes things happen that you either weren't aware of and you'd like to reload and sort of prepare for it next time because you put a lot of investment into the colony or something just goes horribly wrong and you get salty and you want to start again. That seems legit. Uh, there's different sizes. Ludion, Ludionicrus. Sorry, uh, is the <laughs> highest size. You, you can choose the size of the zone that you start in as well as the size of the earth. So in this case, I'm just going to go for 250 by 250 because it's nice and simple. That's all the defaults. Uh, you can also select a random site and click go. We're going to select this site. So we've selected our storyteller, we've selected our site, and we've created our world. Now we get the opportunity to not necessarily choose, but to you know, re-roll the three people that we start with. Because in lore, what's happened is you're an interstellar craft going from A to B and you've hit some disaster and you're all in cryogenic stasis. In fact, I believe you're a prison ship. So you're three prisoners, basically. Random people with random backstories who have just happened to survive this catastrophic event of your ship. So we will randomise until we get something decent. And what I'm looking for here is something like this. A good selection of abilities. Everyone could do everything with some strengths in certain places. Now, six is about the minimum you want to consider for them to be competent at a thing. So you can see it says level six practitioner and they are interested in it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But in this case, it says basic familiarity of shooting. That means they're going to be a bad shot, but they are capable of doing it which means you can equip them with a gun. Uh, and the same as melee, you can equip them with a weapon. They will happily go out and fight, but they won't be that proficient at it. They'll probably take more damage than somebody who was, you know, a level 6, a level 10, that sort of level. Same with shooting. They will take way more shots, but we don't have to worry about ammo. So that's fine. And then uh, the other ones you can sort of distribute across the people that you're going to... Because it's going to be three people, right? So... Between them, you should have a reasonably wide selection of skills. But early on, you're going to want medicine. You're definitely going to want crafting and construction, probably growing as well, and cooking is also extremely important. Those are the things that I would consider to be good starting stats for your colony. Research will come in later, so if you can get a good basis of research from the beginning, it means you don't have to try and find someone who's good at it. Uh, and then social will come in a bit later. But again, these things will start to become useful before you get the opportunity to find someone who's good at it. So even if, even though I say that, you know, medicine, cooking and things like that are really important at the start, 
very soon they will all be extremely important. Now let's have a look over here. We've got some backstories, which is really nice actually. I like this. Um, Yefin was born during a catastrophic war in which both sides used napalm extensively. He grew up helping his parents in the infirmary, treating the cascade of horrific burns from the battlefields. He was left with a lifelong fear of fire. So he's incapable of firefighting as a result of his backstory. And the backstory talks about a completely different planet. You know, these people have come from somewhere. Um, but it does leave him good at medicine. Which is really nice because if people get injured, which is very likely because you're going to need to hunt things, you're going to need to defend yourself, and things might just go wrong. Uh, having someone with good medicine is extremely useful. They are too smart, which is a global learning factor of plus 80%, which is amazing, and a mental break threshold of plus 12%, which means, I believe that means that they will flip out more easily than everybody else, but I think that's okay. And a pessimist means they have a permanent mood effect of minus 6. Now, together, these two mean that this person is likely to go crazy more often than we'd like but I think we're going to be okay with this because they have no health problems currently no relationships which is both a good and a bad thing because sometimes people can hate each other as much as they can you know love each other in the familial familial or uh, or romantic way but having someone who's good at medicine good at research and is pretty good at crafting as well is going to be useful soon and I will explain that in the future now this person is the sister of Zlater Edwards, which is this person. So they get a permanent, well, a, they currently have a plus 20 mood boost. And we'll talk about moods when we start the game. Plus 20 mood boost, but I don't really like this uh, layout because although they are capable of these, they aren't, they don't know how to. So there's a difference. This person is incapable of firefighting. They will not put out a fire because they're terrified of it. Oh, we should read this as well. Yefim was obsessed with old machines and arcane pieces of technology. He obtained them wherever he could and loved taking them apart to see how they worked. He had a habit of talking about his collection long after people around him had stopped listening. We all know those people, which is probably why this person is good at research. Male, he's good at research. But I'll, yeah, keep that. This person I'm probably going to re-roll, but I'll explain why. Remember we said this person is incapable of firefighting. They will not do it. This person is incapable of dumb labour, which is hauling and cleaning. They will not do it. However, they are capable of crafting and are capable of learning to craft at 0.3 times the speed. But currently they have zero skills, so anything that they do will be horrendous. Same as shooting. They can learn to do it, but currently they have absolutely no capability of it. Right? Same, and then for these ones... Uh, this is their passion, so in this case, they are very passionate about learning about animals. They're not currently very good at it, but have a burning passion to do so, and they will learn at 1.5 times the speed. This person has some passion in some things, but no burning desire to do anything, which means they will learn at full speed, plus, plus 80% from the too smart thing, which kind of makes up, these are basically better than burning passions right now because of that. Uh, they're interested in medicine, they're interested in research, they're interested in all these things, and therefore will learn them much faster than the other ones. So you want to make sure that the people are doing the right things in that respect. We'll randomise this person, we will lose the relation, but now we've randomised someone who has health issues. So we're probably going to randomise through this, but we'll talk about this. Hearing loss affects hearing. This person is deaf. I'm not entirely sure what that affects. I, I which is to say, I don't really know what the person's hearing does or does not allow them to do. Maybe it will cause them to, you know, make more mistakes. Maybe it will make them worse at some things. Maybe they'll be worse at shooting. I don't know. And a bad back means that they're, they can't really lift anything. They can't move very fast. They can't carry stuff very well. They're also incapable of intellectual caring and social, which you can see now on this one, firefighting does not actually show up here, but these ones affect some of the skills that they have. They are incapable of social. They will not do anything social, which means they can't negotiate, convince, manipulate, lead, or cheer up other people. They will not do medicine because they're incapable of caring. They will not do research because they're incapable of intellectual. Intellectual. Terrible person. This seems better. They have an excellent melee, pretty good medicine, very strong passion for cooking. Now, three cooking is really the minimum you need of anybody. This person has one. Three allows them to make simple meals and only occasionally poison people, but because they have a burning from, uh, passion to do it, they will learn very quickly. Same with growing. Level three means that they are just about capable of taking care of a farm, but because they have a burning passion to do it, they will learn much faster and they'll become... So this person is quite likely to become our handler, our cook, and our grower, which seems legit. They're basically a farmer. Um... 
very quickly. And they have good melee, and melee is kind of useful in combat, which we will see later, provided we get to it. They also have some desire for art and mining. Now, mining is something you really want to get fairly early on, but it doesn't seem to matter to me, at least, how good they are at it. Their skill in mining will basically determine how quick they are to get through the mining jobs that you give them. This person has a one mining and has no passion for it. So Tony is probably going to have a, like a low level mining thing. But look at this. They are iron willed, which means their mental break threshold is reduced, which uh, reinforces my suspicion that this means it's this increase here of plus 12 means that they are likely they're more likely to break. This one means that they are a lot less likely to break. They're an optimist, which means they have a permanent plus six, which is going to really get on the nerves of Yefin, who is a pessimist, at minus six. And heat tolerant means that if we do get a hot uh, heat wave, uh, they should be okay with it. Plus, that means they can wear more armor, even when it's warm. So we'll keep this person, even though there are a few things. Let's have a look at their backstory. Tony witnessed her parents murder at a young age. This is Batman. Uh, with no guidance... She had to fend herself in any way possible. Joining a small group of misfits, she did whatever was necessary to survive. So it, it could have been bad. Being near many injured fellow criminals, Tony took it upon herself to work on them. Although many people died, she did get better at using knives, which is probably the melee. So she's pretty good at medicine, very good at melee. So we now have two doctors, which is quite interesting. A 10 and a 9, which is actually also really good. If one doctor becomes injured, it's really good to have a backup who can actually heal the first doctor, who can then heal everybody else. Right. Enough of this. <laughs> this is an amazing person as well. Just just the, the numbers here. You know, animals at 13, not actually that useful. We tend to have one animal max, and what animal we get is really going to determine what we do with this, this person. Uh, but I really want a high social person, because the social determines how easy it is to recruit other people. Plus, it determines how much, uh, how much of a price you get when you trade. So we're going to randomize this person till we get decent social. Now, are we happy with incapable of hauling and mining? I'm going to say no. So, ooh. Now, we could have a pacifist. Incapable of violent, therefore, will not do these things. Charity worker. Some of these things could be leveled up. This is not a great person, but I'm getting a little bit bored re-rolling. We do have 13 social and 4 growing. They can do everything else. Not very well, but they can. Which means... Uh, worst case, we put them on a low-level thing and, you know, just have them doing odd jobs around the place. They can be the hauler and the cleaner, and having those things happen is actually a lot more important than you might imagine. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see how this goes. They're 20 years old. They were a coma child. He didn't wake up until he was in his late teens. His body never recovered. But people tend to take pity on him when they hear his story. So that's possibly why he won't do any of these. He's just really weak. Like, he's physically weak because he didn't get the opportunity to move for several years. Glitter worlds are havens of safety and comfort for those lucky enough to live there, but Houston could not ignore nearby planets where people suffered in poverty. He spent his working life appealing for donations and supporting those in need. So his social gets plus six for that, but his mining gets minus three and he will not hunt, which is a strange set of things to come out of charity work, but as you will, he's not a vegetarian at least. Uh, mining minus two and construction minus two here, which, well, okay, it literally says what happens. It's not the shooting and melee, it's the fact that he's... He's weaker, he finds it hard to construct, he finds it hard to mine. That's fair. He will learn to do them, but currently they're on zero. So at 0.3%, eventually this person will be some, somewhat capable of doing those things if we give them those tasks, which we might do because people have to do stuff. Uh, a green thumb is pretty good. He gets a mood bonus for every plant he sows, so this will be our primary grower. Psychically deaf means that he will neither get uh, mood buffs nor mood penalties for psychic things that happen, which is a thing. And a hard worker means that he works faster, which is really nice. So let's just begin. Uh, there's no point waffling on about that anymore. As we play this game, we will see, you know, why I try to choose the array of skills that I do choose. And this is how we start. So uh, you've probably seen this in Avax playthrough. Three of you awake in your crypto sleep sarcophagi. To the sound of science and metal, you barely get to the escape pods before the ship is torn apart. Sometimes later, you land on this unknown rim world. As pieces of the shredded starship fall around you, you start making plans to survive. So, uh, is that loud? I feel like that's loud. Nope, that's just, there must be a sound effect. Uh, we are landing. So here are our crypto sleep caskets. I am pressing spacebar to pause the game, and as you press spacebar, it will flick between the speed that you were on and pause. So it's going to flick between pause and play. You can use one, two, and three to change the speed of it, 
and then eventually it will tell you what's happening. So currently we need beds, we need a weapon and we need to build a room. And here's an info box because when you start the game it will tell you about these things which I think you can turn off here. I think that's this. You can configure how colonists should automatically respond to threats like predatory animals in the assign menu which is here. So here's our menus and here's what it was talking about. Currently everyone's set to flee which I will continue to do but unfortunately they don't flee back home. They just flee. And I think... I don't. Um, Avac was using two mods, one of which put pictures of the uh, the colonists up at the top here, which is extremely useful, but I haven't installed it. And another one adds a button to this menu, the orders menu, so that's architect orders, um, which allows you to select things and unforbid them. First thing we'll talk about, though, is the fact that we've just landed, so we need to decide what to do. We have some people, so we can remind ourselves about the skills we gave them, or the skills we opted for, by clicking on the person, left click to select the person, and we click on uh, character, and it tells us about the character. This person is excellent at melee, so we're going to look. When you land, you have three weapons. There's a pistol, a rifle, and a knife. And I can't find the knife. Where is it? Hello? Knife? Anyone see it? Doo -doo -doo. We'll figure it out. This person can't shoot or melee, so you might as well... <laughs> okay. Uh, you might as well have the pistol, because I want this person to have the knife if I can find it. And this person was a good shooter, or the competent shooter at least. You will have the survival rifle. So what I did there, you notice I was box selecting. That's just it's because I'm super lazy. Um, I find it easier to box select a person than to click on them directly because it's so easy to miss. So you'll probably see people doing this a lot. It's simply because it's slightly easier. So we select this person, we right click on it, and we click equip survival rifle. We right click this person, click on that. We need to find the, the 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 knife. Where's the knife? We did start with a dog, which is really nice as well. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we'll figure it out. So now that we've got people, so if I unpause it now, you will find that the people will go off and pick up the things that they were told to, and then stop. So these people are currently wandering around. If I click on them and look down here, wandering. It also says, uh, I would say idle, but they're not. They haven't got anything to not do. I assume. Let's have a look. This is our zone. You can see there are many walls, steel walls. So these are constructed from previous civilizations, which are not explained. It just is. Here is a room. Now often, if you've ever played this game before, you will know that if you go into this room, you're probably going to get attacked. So you don't go in there. And you can determine that if someone walks by it, it will drop down a thing and it says somebody is feeling a little bit, uh, you know, concerned about this place. This place seems bad. So you'll know if there's a bad thing in there because people who go by it will get a bad feeling. There is some food over here. There's a cougar. There's some muffalo. There are a couple of lumps of rock, but there's not too much sort of solid terrain. There's a nice lump of solid terrain here. There's a fairly nice lump here. So I'm thinking, and there's a geyser here. So I'm thinking what we want to be doing is build our base between here and here. The reason for that is if you use existing pieces of um, scenery, you don't have to build walls because there's a rock. Secondly, this geyser will eventually be uh, a power source for us, which is something you need to know before you play the game the first time. But if you've played the game once or watched anybody else, you'll notice that they're clicking around looking for these things. Incidentally, if we zoom out and double click, it will highlight everything on the screen of the same thing. There's a geyser over there and a geyser over there. So there's currently three, four. Four. One, two, three, four. Okay. These two, are, these three are going to be difficult to use, but early on, not a huge problem because you have to research in order to be able to build the steam generator. So what we do first is we figure out where we're going to build, and then we tell them to build. So the first thing we need, as it says, build a room. A room is composed of separate wall pieces with a door. Use the architect menu to build and then the colonists will do the work that they can. Right. Let's do that first. If we look in the structure menu, we can either cancel the thing that we've told them to do, we can deconstruct something that does exist, we can build a door or an auto door or some walls. If we click on this we can either use silver, steel or wood. 
That's because there is silver, steel and wood available on the map. However, they all have these little X's on them. See that? Silver times 59. But there's an X on it. It's forbidden. The colonists will not interact with this. So the first thing you usually do is zoom out, double click on, excuse me, double click on everything that has an X, press F or click on this. Now it's unforbidden and the X goes away. It doesn't replace it with a tick. So you can easily see that something is forbidden because it has an X on it. So we're going to zoom out, double click on the wood, press F, double click on the steel, which there is a huge amount on this map, press F. We're also going to go over here, discover these survival meals, press F. So when you zoom out, um, it takes a bit of learning, but you learn to recognize, you know, things that you can have. There's more survival meals here. You just zoom out, look around for anything that looks like it's already there anything that looks useful. If it has an X on it, it's probably useful. So I'm not seeing anything further, although what we didn't do is unforbid our actual medicine, our own survival meals, which is odd because I thought I double clicked, but okay. And this knife, there we go. Tony, equip that knife. So there you go, click Tony, right click knife, click equip. Tony has now equipped the knife. We are also allowed to use all this steel and all this wood in order to build stuff. We'll talk about which <laughs> materials you use in the future. Um, the first thing we're going to do is just build a small, not silver, goodness, small steel room because it says build a room and we need beds. If you don't put a bed down, they will sleep absolutely anywhere. So I think the first thing we'll do is try and build a, just turn this alcove into a smallish room for them to have some shelter in. Now I built it out of steel, and the reason for that, well first of all, I don't quite know how much steel we've got, but I think we've got more than enough. Secondly, wood is very flammable, so if anything goes wrong, that room's burning down. Steel is also quite flammable, but not as flammable as wood, and we can determine this. If we have a look at this, you can get information about basically anything in the whole game by clicking on it and press, press, pressing this I button here, right? Including a blueprint. So if we get information on this blueprint, it tells us about what it's going to become. So a steel wall has 20% flammability and the max hit points of 350, which is really just a, an indicative number, a comparative number. So different things have different hit points. And I assume that enemies do actually do damage. So it, it is literally the number of HP that they have. But if we click on uh, wood here, it has 100% flammability and 150 hit points, which I believe translates directly to the wall which we can find out by clicking Architect, Structure. Now when you click on these, that's when the menu shows up. But if you ignore it, it just uses whatever it already is. So it says Steel Wall here. If you click on it, you can change it to Wood Wall, and now it says Wooden Wall. If you click here, you now have a Wooden Wall blueprint here. If we press Information, it has 100% so it has 175 hit points, so it looks like you get a few more hit points just simply for making it into a wall. I wonder if that's in here. Multipliers when made of this. Max hit points, 50%. So it looks like... I don't even know how that, <laughs> that managed because 50% of 150 added to 150 doesn't make 175. But okay, it, it is what it is. Door opening speed is fast. Blunt damage is... I'm, I assume this is 100% of whatever, right? So melee damage. If you make uh, a weapon out of it, it'll have... 80% of the melee damage, or something. I don't know. Uh, but there's a plus two beauty. So, if you make something out of wood, you get a bit more beauty out of it, which is something else we'll look at in the future. I'm going to cancel this by clicking on it and pressing cancel. You can also press C. Ev almost everything has a letter associated with it. But we're going to unpause it on speed three and just let them build this room. You just threw up, which happens. You know, you've got... Um, Probably got sickness from traveling. Yeah, crypto sleep sickness. So what I've done here, selected this person, clicked on health, crypto sleep sickness. So for a while, they're all going to be slightly ill. This person has none, this person has none. So it's just Houston who's currently succumbing to it. Um, but we have needs, carrots. So there's five of these. I've clicked on health to find out what's wrong with them. Consciousness is weak and the manipulation is poor, entirely because of the crypto sleep sickness. Uh, we'll look at that pain in future and also needs. So this is where we were talking about earlier on their moods. 
So if we had kept the sisters, or the siblings, from earlier on, we would see a plus 20 here for both of them, because they're with their sibling. Uh, as it is, we re-rolled them, which means we let those siblings die. Which I'm perfectly happy with, because I am God in this universe. They have very low expectations, because it's new. You know, we've got new colony optimism as well, but, you know... These people are being slightly optimistic about the fact that they've just landed. So you get a buff for a while. See, it says it expires in four days and 22 hours. This one uh, doesn't, but it will expire at some point. And I'm not quite sure of the mechanics of that. Also sick and just generally feeling bad. So we've got minus 10 here, but plus 25 here. So this person's quite happy. Their mood is up here. This is the first mental break threshold. And this is the second one. Somewhere between here and here, they might go loopy. Anything below here, they will definitely go loopy. Okay? And when they go loopy, any sort of afflictions can uh, they can succumb to, much like in The Darkest Dungeon. So this person is currently chopping down this bush, because this bush is in the way of this wall. This makes perfect sense. The bu bush is in the way. We move the wall. We're also going to go to Architect, Structure, and we're going to make a wooden door. Uh... Let's have a look at a steel door. Now look, even though you can click on these, you can also press the information whilst building. Flammability 20, door opening speed 100%. So this is a normal speed opening door. If you make a door out of wood, 120%. So wooden doors open very fast. Uh, and again, note that when we change this to wooden wall, it is still wooden wall. It hasn't gone back to steel unless we click on it and choose steel. If I just ignore this menu and move over here, we're building a wooden wall. Which is why people will just click on that and ignore the menu. They're not clicking on anything, they are literally ignoring the menu because it's already what they want. So it's it remembers the last as a default. Now why aren't you doing anything? And why aren't you doing anything? Probably you have nothing to do. Have we got enough steel? Okay, this person's going... Yeah, he's doing all the work. Good jog, yeah firm. Right, did you see that? That was a roof. As soon as you build a complete structure, it will roof it over for you. So, although roofs do exist in the game, you don't have to do it yourself. This is now protected from the elements, from rain. It's also considered to be indoors. If you have a look down here, it says outdoors when we point here. It says indoors when we point here. That will deter determine where things like toxic fallout will reach, because if it's inside closed doors, Atmospheric effects you basically won't affect you. Outdoors here. It also tells you the temperature, 16C. Indoors, 16C. The indoors-outdoors thing also basically determines where temperature goes. So if we heated this up and it was cold outside, this wall would be sufficient to prevent most of that heat transferring. Although there is heat transfer, it will bleed between the like, across the wall. Um, just to make the heater slightly less efficient. We'll get to that later. So we have an inside room. But it says need colonist beds. Now, early on, you may want to just build beds out of wood. You can click on this, you can choose wood, and you can put beds down. What I prefer to do is just click on sleeping spot. It's not made out of anything, it's just a designation. We have three people, so we'll make three sleeping spots. And we will use Q and E to rotate this. Now, I have discovered over many years of experience that the block that the cursor is pointing at is the head of whatever it is. This includes beds and graves and all that sort of thing. So if it's ambiguous, the head part of furniture or the thing that you're building will be where the cursor is if it's no, one by two. So we're going to make three of these. Now we have room for the people to sleep. They will get sad for sleeping on the ground and they will get sad for sleeping in the same room as each other. But they're just going to have to deal with that for a while because we've just crashed on an unknown planet and they can stop bloody well whinging. Right. I think that's a good start. We've shown how to create a world. We've shown how to use these toolbars. Remember, you click once and you pick, if you want to, a different material. Uh, we've shown how to begin. We've shown how to queue up um, construction. We've shown how to unforbid. And we've shown how to select things and, you know, just basically interact with the world. You can double click on anything to find all of them. Here's a ship chunk. Double click on that. There's one over there, one over there. 
double click on all the muffalo and you can interact with everything and you can box select multiple things so in this case I've actually accidentally found some survival meals that are forbidden so well done me if we select these or these you see how it's also selected the cougar it says various but you can still do the things similarly if you hold shift you can also select more things it just stacks up all the things that you can do to those things so we can unforbid all of them we can forbid all the meals we can hunt all the animals but we can't hunt the meals and forbid the animals right I'm using the middle mouse button to scroll around like this, but you can also use W, S, and D. I prefer to use the middle mouse button because it sort of means it stops when you want it to. So just a little bit, more, little bit more control, but it's entirely up to you. You'll see Avak probably using W, A, w, a S, and D, judging by the way his scrolling seems to work. We've shown how to do that. So we now know how to build a world, build a colony, select the people, tell them what to do, get scared by bears. We've understood selection. Here's some more things which I'm going to unforbid. You know how you, as you sort of move around you spot things so you're not expected to see them immediately. Uh, and here's our first base. It is built into the side of a mountain which is made of sandstone which is quite a soft material but hopefully there's yeah the slate over here so that should be good for us. And in the next episode we can look towards Moving on, we'll see what happens in the next days now that we've got places to sleep. We have to think about survival, we have to think about meals, we have to think about defences, we have to think about, therefore, electricity, and eventually research so that we can get off this planet, which is the goal of the game, and we'll look at mining too. But thank you for watching this first tutorial. I hope it was informative to you. Do leave a comment, any uh, feedback that you have, any questions that you have, I'll try to answer them ASAP, but I'm going to go ahead and record the next episode now. So it will be the third episode before I get to answering any of your questions. But I hope this was at least informative enough that you can understand what other people are doing. And even play the game yourself. Because I do very much recommend this game even though I have not been told to say that. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.